Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for the Inclusive Spaces seminar series at the Bartlett, the Faculty of the Built Environment here at UCL. Today you have joined the June edition of the series uh, entitled Queer Perspectives, Cross-Cultural Experiences in Physical and Online Space. Uh, my name is Claire. Uh, I'm a research uh, student at the Bartlett focusing on queer practices of placemaking. And I am co-hosting this event today with Ben Kampkin, who is a co-director of the UCL Urban Laboratory and professor in the Bartlett School of Architecture. Now, together, Ben and I have been working with others at the Bartlett to initiate a student and staff LGBTQIA uh, network called Be Queer. And as part of this, we are planning a series of events uh, for the next academic year on the theme of queer inclusive urbanism. Uh, and this series will connect queer and trans studies to urban studies and practices of urbanism. Uh, so keep your eyes uh, peeled for that. Uh, before we begin, a little housekeeping. Uh, you might have heard the uh, automated message at the start, uh, but I do want to point out that this session is being recorded and will be added to the faculty YouTube channel, the Bartlett EDI website, and forwarded to all of you that have registered today. We, of course, encourage you to submit questions to our speakers at any point um, by clicking on the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can submit your own questions or actually upvote other people's questions. Of course, as always, an hour is never quite enough, so I anticipate that we will not be able to get to all of your questions, but rest assured that any of, any of them that are not answered will be shared with our speakers. And we also encourage you to join the conversation online on social media by following the hashtag uh, inclusive spaces. Uh, and I think that uh, our speakers, um, Twitter, Instagram handles will be shared in the chat. So the format for today, uh, we're of course going to first welcome uh, Sharif and Regner uh, to present for the first half of this session. Uh, and that will be followed by a Q&A before ending, I have been told rather abruptly at 2 p.m. So let's kick things off. So um, we are really delighted to introduce our speakers, Dr. Sharif Molabokas and Dr. Regner Ramos to talk about their new anthology, uh, Queer Sites, uh, technology uh, in, in global context, technologies, spaces, and otherness. So, Dr. Molabokas is an associate professor in the Department of Communication and Media Studies at Fordham University, New York. His groundbreaking research has been located at the intersection of digital media studies and sexuality studies. He's the author of Gaydar Culture from 2010, which was a really pioneering study of online gay culture. And he has another book on the way out with the leading title of Interrogating Homonormativity, which is due to be published in 2022. Dr. Regna Ramos is Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Puerto Rico. His research on the relationship between queerness and space, including the really innovative and interdisciplinary PhD that he conducted here at Bartlett, fosters experimental research methods and shifts between model making, drawing and performative writing. And this is exemplified in, in his current funded project, Queertopia. Regner is the editor in chief of Informer Journal and the architecture editor at Glass Magazine. And I should also mention he was the editor at large of the amazing Lobby Magazine whilst at the Bartlett. Um, and he's also co-director of Wet Hard Agency. So we're really excited to welcome you both and really look forward to your talk. So over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bart, for inviting us. Um, we, we're going to have a quick chat about the book, and then we're just going to hand it over to Claire and Ben, because we want to get to the conversation um, and get to your questions. But before we started, what Sharif and I wanted to do was situate this project a little bit in terms of um, its scope, its format, and its locations. This project started as my funded project at the University of Puerto Rico called um, Sites Queer, where I was documenting and registering and thinking about queer spaces in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, the capital of the island, and had reached out to both Sharif and Ben with this idea of putting together a conference that would then um, become a book. And it was going to be a conference and a book about Grindr, but we became rather interested in, in, in a more 
diverse approach to queerness where Grindr doesn't kind of just take over the whole discussion. And we were particularly interested in my position at the time, which is where I still am now, which is um, Puerto Rico and how Puerto Rico, you, you never really hear about it in terms of queerness and, and conversations about gender and sexuality and architecture. So we put together this, this project, which has mutated from the conference to the book. Um, and we're excited about what's going to happen in the future. And we'll talk about that a bit later. And this is where we landed with the, with the project. This book comprises a collection of research-based texts that focus on different sites across the globe, which are relevant to the LGBTQ plus community in those locations. More particularly, our book prioritizes divergent histories, narratives, performances, and spatial practices of queer life in geographical and cultural contexts that are often othered by dominant queer the theoretical studies in the West. As editors, we have paid particular attention to include a diverse grouping of stories that destabilize hegemonic understandings which have hitherto lacked critical attention. And I'll add this particularly in architecture. Um, so we're talking about female sex workers, people of color, indigenous populations, Latin communities, trans identities, migrants, among others. We argue that this is a necessary exercise in order to engage in a more thorough, situated and nuanced discussion of queerness. So throughout its 12 chapters, the book draws together work from a broad range of disciplines and showcases a variety of cross-cultural perspectives that foreground the experiences of these LGBTQ plus people living and moving through the Caribbean, South and North America, the Middle East and Asia. So when we did the conference, one conversation that we, we needed to have was where would this conference happen? And we discussed whether it's London, we discussed whether it's New York, where Sheriff is based, we discussed if it's Miami, which is the happy point between New York and Puerto Rico. And then it quickly became important that it happened here in Puerto Rico. And the reasons for this are both numerous and relevant to the political aims of this book. The smallest of the greater Antilles, Puerto Rico, is a colonized island in the Caribbean over which the United States currently maintains political and fiscal control. Its inhabitants are and always have been second class citizens at a political level and continue to be denied the right to vote in US presidential elections. The island's native populations, the Tainos, were brutalized, raped, enslaved, and eventually wiped out by Spanish conquistadores who first landed on the island shores in 1493. Those sailing under the Spanish flag reached Puerto Rico, traveling in the same vessels used to transport men and women who had been ripped from their African homeland to be enslaved as part of Spain's empire building mission. It was thus by these violent and dehumanizing means that Puerto Rico became a veritable melting pot of identities. Set against this history of trauma, displacement, colonization and enslavement, and sensitive to the ongoing social, political and economic issues faced by many of the island's inhabitants, the conference that we organize acknowledge both the island's bilingual condition, Spanish and English, and its strategic geographic position. As a US territory, Puerto Rico was able to politically host some nationalities without the needs for visas, acting as a neutral, non-combative space of encounter outside of the frictions of the mainland and where the island's cultural history links it to so many other geographies with similar colonial pasts. One thing that is particular about the conference that both Sheriff and I enjoyed and we really wanted to extend to the book was the fact that we had senior lecturers and kind of seasoned academics presenting their work alongside some students who were doing their undergraduate work. Um, we found that to be a really interesting dialogue and some of the most innovative research that we saw presented at the conference came from the, the younger, more junior um, scholars. And that's something that we wanted to extend into the book. So Sherry, maybe you want to say a little bit about that while I yeah. use this presentation format because I don't want to do PowerPoint, I want to do performance it today. Yeah, uh, hi everyone, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you uh, to, to the Bartlett School. Um, uh, for hosting us uh, and to Nishat for all of the uh, kind of 
back end work to to get things happening um and also a, a thank you to regna actually for bringing me onto this project this is all him uh the conference was him and and while uh, ben and i offered some kind of guidance uh you know this 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 started with regna and i really want to acknowledge that um the conference itself brought together both senior and junior scholars, early career researchers and seasoned professors and academics, but also as well activists, people who are kind of spanning the divide between academia and activism. And this is something that we wanted to try and take through into the book as well. Um, it was an interesting decision, some people said um, uh, around this, um, and I think that there are certain hierarchies that are at work within academic publishing. But here's the thing, it was within those early career researchers work that we saw this willingness, this openness, perhaps even a demand to blend and experiment with digital and hybrid technologies and spaces in order to write. And I mean, write in a, in a, a variety of different ways. Um, it was because of these early career scholars that we were able to bring in kind of a sense of uh, native digitality to, to the project. You know, these are scholars who've come of age at a time when barriers between academic and activist work are slowly crumbling. Um, this is something that we wanted to get through in, in, in the book as well. And of course, the precarity of the life of junior scholars can't be overlooked, right? I don't want to sort of romanticize away the material reality of higher education um, and the immense cost of, of that. But I also don't think that we should overlook the intellectual freedom and the energy and particularly the boldness that we uh, often saw at the conference coming from our early career colleagues um, and so we wanted to bring that into um, the book we also wanted to try our best to explore the performative dimension or to, to rather try and translate the performative dimension of the conference now the conference um which was wonderful um was a fantastic and very intense um event wasn't only kind of spoken papers um it included variety of performative elements there were artistic interventions there were kind of activist proclamations and statements there were drag shows there were uh kind of um round tables there were installations and exhibitions um and so there was very much a, a focus both in the conference and around the conference on this kind of more performative experimental and and uh um an innovative way of, of, of thinking now of course that's really difficult to translate into a book. Um, you know, the book requires that certain elements be pinned down into a textual form and, and not all of the conference papers, conference presentations and performances were translatable in, in, into the book. But what we've tried to do is foster an approach to writing the book that kind of honors the performative. Um, and in some cases that allows the, the text to be a little bit looser and more transient while trying to capture the lived experience of the, um, of the, the kind of uh, the case studies and the informants that, that appear in there. The book also works at different scales, and this is something that we really wanted to capture, this movement and this kind of crashing and colliding of global space, local space, the space of the individual body, of the city, of the locale, and then of, of, of the nation as well. And so it moves between chapters and within chapters, it moves in different scales. And I wanna pull out just a few examples here. So for instance, Ben Campkin's work um, on the large scale infrastructure project that is uh, Crossrail in, in London um, is, is a great example of how uh, the infrastructural uh, spaces and the infrastructural projects of, of a capital city also then impact and uh, rework notions of no normativity and homonormativity, often at the expense of other non-heterosexual identities. Then we might think, you know, scaling further than the city uh, to the work of Jody Liu. Um, Jody's uh, offered us a fantastic chapter looking at Sester Foster, the, the, the anti-sex work and um, anti-sex trafficking uh, 
legislation um, in the US. Um, and so this is working at the space and the level of the nation state and, and the controlling of bodies through this legislation. And what Jody's work does is pick out how the carceral po politics and a carceral feminism plays out both at the level of abstract legal philosophy, but also then literally touches the bodies of queer people of colour and particularly trans women of colour. And then from those kind of larger spaces, we move into um, to, uh, kind of both uh, regional spaces, uh, in particular Khaled al Saleh's work on, around the Arabian Peninsula, but then also specific religious spaces as well. So for instance, um, Khaled's work uh, looks at the spaces and the of, of homes and mosques in the Arabian Peninsula um, and looks at the ways in which bodies are surveyed in different locations, of bodies regulated by the homosociality of these particular institutions, but those bodies passing in order to form digital spaces within those physical spaces, spaces of play, negotiation and resistance. And then, of course, we must also think of the space of the domestic as well. Um, and we can think of um, Alo Jed uh, Rebus's work, their, their project on uh, trans migrants, transgender migrants uh, moving to Berlin um, is framed around the concept of the house projects. These are semi-permanent, uh, semi-autonomous uh, squatter spaces um, that contain and hold lives that are often in transition in every sense of the word. Um, and so we wanted to kind of move through these different, these different registers of, of, and, and different scales of space um, in order to identify the ways in which the global becomes the local, the local, the local then translates that in order to produce performances. Um, and one such performance um, element would be Liliana Macias's work, uh, where she looks at uh, Cabaret Parodia. Um, this is the formation of a, of a very transient space, a quite a fragile space, the space of performance and the ways in which these spaces um, are created as forms of resistance. Calvary Parodia um, is a Spanish language drag show um, that is performed both in the gender normative spaces of working class Latinx communities in Chicago, but then also gets translated into spaces of uh, highly white, white supremacist spaces of uh, Boys Town in Chicago. And so we see also even in the transient, the ways in which we're, we're um, acknowledging this collapsing of the global and uh, the local. I'm going to hand back over to, to Regna now to, to talk a little bit about the, the different writing methods we've also been able to capture in the book. Circling back to this idea of per performativity, there is also an element of that in the different writing methods that we wanted to pursue in the book. So for instance, we'll start with, with mine. I write in a very fragmented mode and I'm borrowing these ideas from Jane Rendell who also um, is, is part of the Bartlett where I take stories of places throughout using different perspectives and depending on how the text is laid and what its typographical elements are, they kind of clash with each other and interrupt each other, but they kind of create an, an alternate way of telling a story about a place or architecture. And this is one example of how I do it on my own research website. We also have this project called Here, Here. It's a chapter um, in the book by Errol Bougeau and, and Victor Macias Gonzalez. And they've got this really interesting project situated in this small Midwestern town called La Crosse. And they're mapping stories using audio narrations. And they created this map where you could view the full story or you could listen to the full story. And of course, queer, Queering the Map, which is Lucas La Rochelle's project, um, and it's become such a huge success. They're part of the book as well. And Queering the Map, what it does is it creates a register of queer sentiments, emotions, nostalgia, and memories situated to particular places, not just in, in where the project started in Canada, but it's, you can see it's got thousands and thousands of thousands and thousands of stories 
all across the world, dropped into bodies of water in the most um, diverse group of, of geographies that you could imagine. So we have stuff that's experimental, like this idea of, of querying site writing, the historical and the archival, like in the case of here, here, and this anecdotal mode of telling of telling one's biography, which is Lucas's project. Thanks, Regna. Um, so in terms of how the, the chapters were organized, we, we really struggled a little bit, actually. Um, there was a sense that we, we would need to try and conform to uh, a particular organization with, with sections and, 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 and uh, hard and fast themes. And actually, as we started to work through this, we recognized this absolutely wasn't gonna be the case because we are still understanding and, and uncovering and revealing the different themes that run across the chapters in different ways. So the, it became a, a jigsaw puzzle that we were continually kind of building and then taking apart and, and, and rebuilding again. Um, and that's something that we'll return to um, uh, shortly. But the chapters uh, therefore stand on their own and also work in conversation with one another. And they're primarily organized around technological and spatial case studies. So for instance, on the screen here, you can see um, the, the website for uh, um, an anti-discrimination campaign known as Kinder, which was launched by the um, uh, gay dating and hookup app Grinder, um, and I use this as one of my uh, as a case study to explore the the politics of politeness, um, which I suggest are homonormative and which continue to frame the issue of race through distinctly white, middle class, and cisgendered forms of being. And so I kind of am exploring the ways in, in which not just Grinder but other apps as well. So for instance, we, we might think about apps such as Blued, um, apps such as Scruff, so on and so forth. The ways in which a particular understanding of race and racism is reinterpolated and reorganized through normative politics. Um, other spaces um, that are digital would, of course, include Here, Here and Queering the Map, which uh, Regna has, has spoken of as well. If anyone hasn't checked out um, uh, Queering the Map, which is, uh, um, was developed by Lucas La Rochelle, please do so. It, it's, a, it's a fantastic resource. And what's really interesting in the article, in the chapter that uh, Lucas has prepared for us, is the way in which he suggests you read the map. Um, and he suggests a kind of a process of disorientation and losing oneself within it in order to kind of get this sense of queerness and, and loss and, and isolation and mobility and movement. There's a really lovely way of kind of thinking about not reading maps or, or rereading maps in, in different ways. Then of course there are physical purely physical sites or physical primarily physical sites so we might think of the Kenwood Ladies Pond um, uh, Low Marshall, obviously, of, of, of also of the Bartlett School of Architecture as well, offered us a fantastic chapter um, that looked at, kind of began with the media coverage of the kind of trans scare um, uh, of uh, around the ladies, uh, uh, Kenwood Ladies Pond, and looked at the ways in which uh, the pastoral and this kind of very um, almost ethereal space um, has historically been connected with a particular vision of middle class white cisgendered femininity um, and how that has actually served to obscure other uh, bodies, subjectivities and identities who, who have used that spaces. I've also already mentioned the idea of the Crossrail project, the house project um, and, and San Juan as well. I, I really want to um, kind of big up uh, Regner's amazing kind of site specific work where he's kind of taking us through uh, how the transient spaces of San Juan queer life operate at, at a kind of hybrid scale. And then we've got those interventions as well, interventions into space, spaces that are claimed and reclaimed and temporarily appropriated by a particular queer folk in order to make a, a statement. So Cara Cabaret Paradia uh, would one would be one with Bozole con uh, la Frida um, as one example. And I want to finish this section by talking also about one other particular intervention, uh, and that is of Jiang Kao. Now, full disclosure, there are those times when 
you're working on a project and for whatever reasons, uh, you know, you lose a chapter and you think, oh, what am I going to do? Where, am, where are we going to go? And then into our lap falls this wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, piece of work that was offered us um, uh, by um, uh, Eduardo and Mabia. And this is a case study of a, a person living in uh, Quilombo in Brazil. And I want to finish with this because Jan Cao fits into all of those categories I was just talking about. And in many respects, actually brings all of the themes of the book together. Um, she, he helps to untie the connections, these connections, formalities and reformulate them. So just to very briefly explain, um, Jan Cao lives in Quilombo. Um, and uh, a quilombo is uh, a space that was traditionally um, uh, created by and for Afro-Caribbean uh, forced migrants to Brazil. So enslaved people and, and uh, occupying these spaces. Now, these spaces are legally recognized, but continue to face forms of judicial and extrajudicial violence and trauma as that space is, is um, reappropriated for commercial means. What's really interesting is the way in which Jan Kao in this space, a trans-identified Afro-Caribbean individual uses the global platform of Instagram, okay, a platform developed in Silicon Valley, thousands of miles away, um, in order to connect their own understandings and identities uh, with a global audience as well. So there's a smashing together here of the micro and the macro of the global north and the global south. And it doesn't render this divide irrelevant, right? We're, we're not talking about some kind of uh, kind of post-structural breaking down of these material realities, absolutely not, because to do so would be to blind oneself to the very uh, material reality of the Quilombo, but it does reveal the constructed nature of that north-south divide and the ways in which these technologies are offering opportunities to, to challenge and to queer that. And so Jan Cao, through their performances uh, on Instagram, um, operates and operationalizes a project of deconstruction, a project of performance and of reconstruction. Um, and we were so happy to be able to in, in, in include this um, a uh, wonderful kind of you know chapter in the analysis of Jan Kao's performances because in many ways it kind of speaks to all of the themes that we we have tried to raise uh, within this um, and those themes that we've highlighted you know you know very much focus on the concepts of hostile environments whether that be the 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 environment of uh, of racism or various phobias but also the, the challenging politics of spaces that of supposed safety that turn hostile through a lack of awareness or a refusal to engage in the politics of intersectionality. And then also, I think another thing that we've, we've been exploring in the book is that of spatial practices, the carving out of spaces. So the book really explores the different ways in which both physically, performatively, and also digitally, there's a carving out of spaces for existence, for resistance, and for playfulness within the lives of the queer folk who feature um, in the book, of passing and playing and of rupt rupturing spaces of normativity. Now that the book is out and we've seen it kind of change formats and and I don't know, we, we're kind of thinking about where do where do we go? What what's the future direction for us? And we're really interested in in how do these things the sheriff was mentioning, how there's no order to them, but really you can read the material alongside the chapters and come up with new interpretations. And so we're thinking about how to take that forward because we've paired them and kind of structured them in, in a specific order in the book, which wasn't really ordered, but we've gone thinking about, is there a second book here? Is there a, a different conference? And we're going to be doing, Sheriff, should I mention it? Or would you like to, to mention it? Please, please, please do. We, we thought that the, the best way to move the book forward, because we had this 
really nice book launch where we invited the contributors, we invited close friends, um, and we asked some of our friends who are designers and artists and researchers to pick a chapter of the book and react to it in whatever method they wanted to. So we had Jiang Kao do a performance, we had people do mappings, we had people do audio visual and, and, and video images. And it was really interesting to see how they were digesting the material. Um, we obviously, we had this platform today, which was super important because it was more kind of like the academic um, presentation of the book. And then we started thinking about what are the possibilities of regrouping these chapters together and launching a, a virtual reading group in the fall of 2021. So we're going to be having four sessions and we're going to be inviting um, each session will have two authors or two chapters of the book. And we're going to be reading those two chapters alongside them. Uh, some of them, they've been paired in terms of um, session one is living in hostile environments. So it's about trans and queer people of color. The ses second session will be the spaces of queerness. And we'll be talking about mapping as a research method. The third session will be about race and racism and gay male culture. And the fourth session will be about trans experiences um, non-white, focusing on non-white um, locations. And we're really excited to see what material comes out of this. We're particularly interested in having graduate students and, and advanced undergraduate students and postgrad students join us to see how they understand the material, put forward what they're doing. And maybe we can offer ways to think through different methodologies and, and, and offer any kind of input that we can. Um, and see where that takes us. And if anyone is interested in joining this, you can find um, all the info and the registration info is on my site, which is lsite.xyz. And you have exactly what's happening, when it's happening, what time and the registration for all of them. Um, and I think that we're going to hand it over now to Ben and Claire so that we can have a chat. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really excellent uh, overview of the book and really conveyed some of the energy and excitement that's contained in the book, but also from the conference. Um, I really enjoyed the way that you took us through the different media and uh, methods as well as the content of the contributions. And I think it really conveys this dynamism that you've captured um, and you know managed to generate from thinking through queer sites from San Juan through the theme of technology, but interpreting that in um, lots of different ways um, and lots of different geographical contexts. Um, so, you know, of course, um, we only have a limited amount of time, but um, we do want to invite people if they have questions to post them in the Q&A. Um, and um, perhaps if I could start with a question and, and if I could ask uh, Sharif and Regna to try and keep their answers um, concise so that we can um, try and uh, address some of the audience's questions as well, that would be great. Um, so I guess one question that I was wondering is, with this global framing of the book, um, which is a really important intervention in the Western dominated canon around queerness and queer space in particular, and thinking about this through other places, but also other subjectivities and across different media and practices, I was wondering what the process of compiling the collection reinforced view about the potentials and also the complexities of doing that work because you, you kind of made it sound um e you know in a way you know se seamless in your presentation there um but what what kind of what might be the complexities of doing that whether they be uh, ethical or linguistic or um institutional or thinking about different histories i was just wondering if you had any comments on that in terms of your your process of learning through the book and i asked this because Personally, I learned a lot through thinking about my own work in relation to your brief for the conference and the and the book and thinking about what are the sort of global dimensions of of, um, of our city in London. Um, so yeah, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on on that after completing the book. Are you happy for me to go, Regna? That's okay. Yeah, Ben, thank you so much for that question. I'll, I'll try and be as brief as as as, as possible. Um, one of the things that I think whenever you're, you use that word global, you start thinking about is, oh, my God, I'm not capturing the global. Like We didn't have um, uh, a contribution in the book from Australasia, although we did have 
uh, representation at the conference. Trying to, to, to take a UN approach, as it were, to this doesn't work. Um, but at the same time, also, there's a real danger in focusing on the in focusing on the global in suggesting that this is basically the global south, as it were, um, when in fact projects such as mine and yours um, and, and, and Lowe's demonstrates that actually when we need to think about, for instance, the question of queerness and otherness, we also need to think about the ways in which that isn't represented fully within, for instance, the Western canon as well, right? So, you know, within the spaces of London or within the spaces of kind of, you know, digital, digitally normative gay male space and so on and so forth. So there were there were there was constantly this issue that, that, the, that we faced about our, of inclusivity and inclusion and what, what does that mean? Um, that's not something that we ever really fully resolved other than saying, so maybe we'll think about volume two, right? Maybe that's what we address in, in, in the next volume. But there were some practical challenges. This book is published in English. This is not something that we were necessarily happy about. The title of the book even was something that we had to go back and forth on and we lost the argument with um, on this. And we have asked for this to be uh, uh, made available in uh, the Spanish language as well. This is where we butt up against particular kind of um, uh, hegemonies of, of, of language. And it is something that we have not yet fully resolved in, in some respects. And I think Regna would agree with me when I say there's almost a sense of, well, let's see if we can sell it in English and then we'll see whether there's a market in, in a different language. But it is something that I feel is still unresolved with, with, within the book in terms of that and then in terms of the ethics as well you know it's, it's being able to do this kind of research and activism and work um really does depend on the 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 institution but also the region that you're you're, you're based within and it's not surprising that some of our work is being produced so for instance uh, Khaled's work which is about the Arabian Peninsula is actually being produced in a UK university. So there's also this issue about um, diasporas of, of, of activism and academia that we also have to kind of uh, bear in mind. Hopefully that, that's, that's answered the question. Was there anything that you wanted to say, Regnal, or should we move on? Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm struck by the idea of an anthology as actually a place where you can um, have an approach which isn't about resolving things necessarily, but opening up a conversation. Um, uh, so um, thanks very much. Um, I know that uh, Lowe uh, Marshall, who um, is uh, Dr. Lowe Marshall, who's uh, based also at the Urban Lab and contributed to the conference in the book, has also joined us. Um, and Sherry mentioned Lowe's chapter. I wondered whether you wanted to say anything. Hi, Lowe. I wondered whether you wanted to say anything. Um, more about your chapter or whether you had any uh, comments or reflections on the project from your perspective. Thanks so much and thanks for inviting me to jump in. It's been so nice to hear you both talk about the book and the work and the process and the thoughts behind everything and, and to think back upon that uh, conference that seems like such a long time ago now when we could like travel safely and things like that. Um, and thank you so much Shri, for your really generous um, overview of my chapter I'm not sure how much I can top that but I suppose it's really nice to have something this like very quintessentially kind of English which is really this kind of white English pastoral space right uh, sit alongside this book which is so global in its context so it becomes particularized um, I think that's really important um, and you know it was really interesting actually the conference was really formative in my writing this became a PhD chapter and it was really the conference was really formative in my thinking about that about how this weird space you know usually in the trans debate it's general spaces it's toilets it's changing rooms it's schools how this very particular space what is it about this space that becomes so instrumentalized within these discourses both for and against trans inclusion I think thinking about the spatial in that way and the role of urban imaginaries the way that they're gendered and racialized um yeah I mean I hope it's quite generative in thinking around that and um actually I think it really makes sense in this what it where, where it sits in the book it really makes sense of the chapter in a really nice way so yeah thank you for including me I don't know if there's yeah anything else to reflect on but. brilliant thanks Lou um so I think at this point we have got some uh questions that are coming through in the Q&A um, so we will uh, do our best to uh, go through some of those now. And I've noticed 
that there's a couple that are um, interested in how the sort of different media that you're dealing with in all of these different projects and that you presented there um, through the really dynamic visual presentation, how that diversity of, of media and materialities translate in the context of the book. How did you think about that um, and work with that? I, I hope I'm, I'm, people have written that much more eloquently than I've just said, but, and also just dealing with, you know, social media and uh, these queer discourses around queer space in relation to different media. Um, how does that translate into the context of the book? Is, is there anything that you would like to add on that? Um, I, I, I read the question and I think it's a fantastic question. I'm not sure if Sharif would agree. I think that it doesn't translate. I think that you can't, especially with a publishing house like Routledge, even like Sharif mentioned it, we didn't even have control over the title of the book. We didn't have control over the cover image of the book. It's, it's what the institution says. And the format is so tight, the amount of words you can print. Um, we didn't even find out how many images we could include. So I think that's why Sharif and I are interested in in fostering a series of events, reading groups, maybe another conference, a different iteration to see how this, the richness of the, the material, we can think through it. Often books I think are, are thought of as an output. You finished writing, you finished the research, you put it in the book and you're done and people buy it and that's it. But we're really thinking about the energy that this material has and that the research has and how much it's going to change. I'm sure that the people who, who wrote the chapters of the book now two years on in writing the chapter it has changed as well so I think that maybe what we need to do and this goes back to my fragmented way of of writing and seeing things is to not think of the book as the sole output but rather as a fragment of the work that is complemented by these other things that the book can't capture maybe there are different ways of trying that with book and ebooks and whatnot but I think that for us, we're interested in, in the idea of this satellite, of this project, and then having these little satellites that kind of connect to it and that allow for their, the, each particularity to shine. Wonderful, thank you, Regna. Um, is there anything you wanted to add on that? Uh, just, I mean, I, I would, Regna's being, I, I agree with, with Regna, and I'm also going to push back and say that I actually think that Regna does a fantastic job in his chapter, as does um, uh, as does Lucas La Rochelle in, in, in trying to get that performance. One of the things that some of the chapters do offer this, offer this disorientation and this, this fragmentation that come, comes through, you know, which gives you a sense of the, not just the different media, but also the ruptures between them. And I think that that's, that's been great. So, you know, I know Ragnar wouldn't say that, but you know, I, I will, will say that for him. But also I really hope that actually the reading group and the other initiatives that you know, we, we, we're thinking about, actually people then start to bring in and say, no, actually, I think we should be refiguring this and so on and so forth, which brings on and, 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 and helps to kind of continue this, this, this conversation. Great, thanks, Claire. Thanks, Ben, um, and thanks, Sharif, Regner, and Lo, uh, for uh, for really providing such depth and breadth to this book. I know that's no mean feat in twenty something minutes, so it's much appreciated. Um, I think something I really want to tease out is um, something you spoke about uh, just now, but also as part of your introduction, and it's this commitment to empowering researchers who are developing queer research. And actually, we've had a, a question in the chat uh, by Pepe, who says, as a recent uh, architecture master's graduate, uh, do you have any recommendations to pursue a career in queer spatial research? Um, and I had, I had a similar question, which was uh, along the lines of if you could write to your younger self or if you were advising students today, uh, what would you highlight uh, as both enriching uh, or difficult about doing queer research in uh, higher education? And this can perhaps be generally or within your own dis disciplines. Where is that question, Claire? So, it was, oh, it was just in the, it, I think it might be in your answered section uh, now, if you can see the Q&A. Could yeah. you please share the site screen? Um, if you scroll down. 
Yeah, I've got Do you have any yeah, recommendations yeah. Have for recent architecture yeah. master's graduates going to pursue career in queer spatial research? Yeah, I think that is a very big question. And maybe what you what would be helpful is to find out what is of interest to you? What is your particular research interest? And I think that reaching out to the people that you that you've read or the people that you've engaged with their work. They're a lot more susceptible to saying yes to having a chat and, <laughs> and brainstorming through a few ideas. Um, and I, that I think it's every every field is very different. It depends where you want to do the research. It depends on what it is. Um, and I think for me personally, the Bartlett, you know, it was an, a UK institution and, and the Bartlett is very experimental and has a load of diversity in terms of the research that is considered research. Um, and in my case, it was kind of like coming into this super English context and having to not be so Caribbean and Latino and loud and kind of expressive and really learn how, how to write research. And it wasn't until I finished in my Viva that I kind of learned that, okay, now I can let go. My research can be queer in itself. I don't think that you ever stop learning how to be queer. I think that it, you, it's a constant process of challenging yourself and relearning and, and forgetting things as well. So my suggestion would be find the people who you admire or who are relevant to the things that you're interested in, reach out to them, send them an email and say, I would love to talk to you about this idea that I have and pick your brain. And I'm sure that you're going to get people who are going to totally be up for it. I yeah, that. I would just just I would just add to that that I mean because you know Regner approached me you know um, and 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 um, uh, was incredibly flattering which always helps with an ego like mine um, but also <laughs> Regner came with an idea and that for me is always the most important thing you know whereas something is like I can't say no right like this is such an attractive idea this is so interesting you know I I, I really have to kind of engage with that so I think that it's, it's the ideas that you have that you take to the people that you want to work with you know can, can be really and sometimes they don't have the, the capacity sometimes you know it's it often it's a lot of the time is fake when it comes to that kind of thing but 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 you you are your ideas and, and and taking that to the person I think is really important super thank you um I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions um and we've got some really interesting ones coming in um, I was wondering whether you could address this question. There's a, somebody that uh, Michael Pickett has uh, asked this question around really how you're thinking about otherness, um, which I think is really interesting um, in the in relation to um, worldness or global culture. Um, so how how did, how did you approach otherness? Megan, do you mind if I start? Yeah, I mean, Michael, thank you so much for your for your question. Um, I think that's a it's a really we we were very very expansive in our understanding of of otherness, and, and one of the things I suppose that we wanted to uh, the only kind of guideline that that, that that we had was that we wanted to to look at I suppose for one of a better phrase that kind of you know um, otherness as being refracted through the lens of normativity. So whether, you know, and that's, that gets us back to this, this different way of, and, and, and more complex way of thinking about the global. So, you know, otherness comes through in, in, in the situation of Lowe's fantastic chapter, which I absolutely love because for me, actually, otherness gets rendered through the Kenwood's Lady Pond because the more I read Lowe's work and, and, and that chapter again and again, I feel that the Kenwood Ladies Pond is actually a colonialist project, right, of, of, of white supremacy and gender supremacy, cisgender supremacy that then, you know, pr produces this kind of otherness. Um, so I think uh, the, the otherness, you, you also mentioned kind of, you know, the, 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 the lack of, um, try and scrolling up to, to find the, 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 the question. Um, oh. Uh, it's actually also just to interject and say that I didn't actually pose all of the question, but it is really interesting. The other aspect of the question, which is um, Com had you looked at the anthropological lack. side of commonality or is there lack of queer world culture? Yeah, actually, I don't think that that's something that we did explore. Um, and I think that that's actually something that 
I would hope that going forward, you know, the, this, the, the book keeps opening itself up. And Michael, that's such a great question because I think actually there are commonalities within it, but we haven't thought about it in an anthropological sense. We thought about it thematically, but not anthropologically. And I think that there could be some further work to be there, done there to think about queer world culture, definitely. Regna, was there anything that you wanted to, to, to add there? No, I think um, I was just going to write in the chat that there's a bunch of really interesting questions that we won't have time to address, but I'm going to be answering them in video format on my Instagram. So if you just copy and paste the question, if we don't have time to answer it, I'll, and, and also by Twitter, whatever is easiest for you, we're super happy to continue the conversation going. That's really generous of you. Thank you, Ragnar. Um, yeah, some of the questions, um, uh, we will pick up if they're related to Bartlett um, activities as well. Um, yeah, I think those those comments were really uh, insightful, Sheriff, and the question around queer world culture just seems really fascinating in terms of how the book prompts us to think more about this, um, you know, because there is this, you know, the, there's a debate around the kind of export, the neo-colonial export of LGBT identities and the kind of global gay um, white unmarked white cis male um, figure um, but also we're in this moment of the pandemic and there are all of these possibilities for global connectivity and for activisms in different places to to link up so it does seem really really timely that your I know that was your book was way before that um, historical context but it's opened up these new, new opportunities and I'm sure will come out in the um, reading group that you're organizing which sounds really exciting. Um, we are going to have to wrap up in a second. Um, Claire, did you want to ask um, one, any, uh, did you want to pick up on any of the other questions or? Um... Yeah, I'd love to. I actually have a ton of questions. So if I'm, I'm to pick one, I'd actually like to pick um, Bobby Lee's question in the chat, uh, which is, I am wondering if there were intertwined factors between online spaces, physical spaces, but also individual bodily space um, and any findings or insights that you might want to share with us? Uh, I'm so sorry, could you repeat that question? Did I drop out? I've had patchy internet. No, it no, I was, uh, I was doing that terrible thing of answering someone else's question in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I, no I worries, no worries. It's just, a, it's a question that's come in from, from Bobby Lee that's uh, right. asked us to expand a little bit more on the intertwined factors between between online space, physical space, okay. and bodily space, uh, and maybe just to speak to that a little bit. Well, I think that we we encountered this when we were initially thinking about the book and having it in section, then we were thinking about a section on technology, a section on otherness, a section on space. But some of the chapters dealt with these things together, and it was really impossible to kind of categorize them. And I think Sheriff mentioned Jan Kao, when we, we finished talking about the different chapters of the book and that particular chapter, which we also really like the idea of having a chapter dedicated to one person. It's not about a group of people. It, I mean, it is, but it's also about the singular story of Jan Kao as this trans quilomboa um, Instagram user. And it's in, you can't talk about Jan Kao without talking about Instagram, without talking about the space of the quilomboa in Brazil. So. I think that that's what is particularly queer about what we're trying to do in the chapter is, and I, I think that queer is very, we do have categories for different types of queer, I suppose, but really they're just words. Queer is much more messy. And I think that that's where we, where we would like to continue taking the, the book forward is through playing with this idea of the mess of kind of dividing, blurring the borders between things because we, Jan Kao was inseparable from all these three things. Um, in my chapter, I think as well, the fact that I am a researcher talking about the space that's next to my apartment, my unwillingness to talk about it in the third person. Um, and just, it's a space that I'm in, it's part of my life, it's the space with my friends go in. So you are embedded, your body is embedded through a lot of these chapters, through your personal experiences. We allow for autoethnographical and auto autobiographical types of writing as well. Um, so I think that that's, I think, one of the things that we learned is the categories sometimes aren't helpful. 
Yeah, and I, I think actually, if I could just, um, Bobby, you you mentioned the word um, memory, and I think that that's actually the fourth category thinking about it that we could have had in in this, because actually, in so many ways, the concept of memory, memory marking spaces, whether it be in the house project and people recycling material, whether it be the hidden memories and and the lost histories at the at the um, you know in in San Juan's queer spaces or at the Kenwood Ladies Pond or indeed you know in 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 central London, you know, or whether it be kind of responses. To to ephemeral forms of racism that don't linger, but nevertheless are kind of like re, kind of like re sort of uh, imagined through anti-discrimination campaigns. I think memory is actually what links a lot of these together. So even though these are performances and ways of being and living, they're also ways of memorializing, um, you know, uh, however informal that might be. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, uh, that's been a really exciting uh, conversation and uh, just, I think, shows that the, the reading group that you've been talking about is going to be really uh, fruitful. Um, Claire, did you want to uh, add anything? We're maybe running out of time, I think. But... Uh, just five seconds. I've loved this. I wish we had another two, three hours just to chat, but I'm going to show up to the reading group um, uh, and I can't wait for it. And thank you so much for today and for, for letting us come a little bit closer to the work in this way. It's It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so, for having us and thank yeah. you everyone for coming. Thanks for me too. And congratulations on the book. It's an excellent book. And thank you also to Lo for joining us. Um, and may I also please thank uh, Nishat who, um, who's been helping yeah. organize this event and Steve. Um, and also uh, Kamla Patel, who's our Vice Dean, who initiated the Inclusive Spaces series and has um, generously supported uh, this event. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for coming. And as we've said, we will do our best to follow up with questions that haven't been answered. Thanks for your engagement. Um, and everybody, I think, will receive an email as follow up to the event um, and uh, we'll make it clear how to how to continue the conversation with the various links that have been mentioned. So thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. <laughs>